I'm an artist that started making games a couple years ago and I realized that basically every game art style can be broken down into three simple elements. So in this video I thought I'd share that with you with some real examples before showing you my process for putting those elements together to create a mock-up with a challenge at the end so you can give it a shot as well. As a disclaimer, this video should apply to all game art styles, but I'm mostly experienced with 2D and pixel art, so please keep that in mind. And in no way are these set rules. These are just my observations that I thought could help you out. If you have anything to add, then please let me know in the comments. Let's learn together. So what are the three elements? Well, it's what I call the game art act. Atmosphere, clarity, and theme. Let's dive a little deeper into this with the help from RT, a little art robot I created to help illustrate the points in this video, and also as a way for me to procrastinate actually making the video. <coughs> Starting with atmosphere, which is the feeling of game art. We know that looking at art can evoke certain feelings, right? But rather than a static image, games are an interactive medium, and a strong atmosphere can help fully immerse the player into the world you're building. I think it's crucial to mention it's not just art that contributes to a game's atmosphere. There are so many pieces of the game atmosphere pie that I can't possibly mention them all here, but nevertheless, art can be a very important slice. So how do we do it? Well, we do this by establishing a style, using our art tools, the core fundamentals and design principles. We use these in compositions that evoke certain feelings. It sounds complicated, but you don't have to be an expert to analyze how something makes you feel. You just look at it, write how it makes you feel, and then break it down into its art components so you can start making some associations. Obviously, it does help to have knowledge of art fundamentals and design principles, but you don't need a lot, and hopefully this video can get you started there. Let's go through some examples. I asked you for some of your favorite games, and then I asked you again how they make you feel while showing you some screenshots. Let's take a look. Blasphemous. How does this make you feel? The words I got were intense, abandoned, creeped out, suffering, dark, dramatic, nervous, curiosity, mysterious, and shady. How does it achieve this? Context matters, so let's look at that first. It's a gothic setting with elaborate and detailed backgrounds, a serious looking character, and in some of the shots we even have some violence or gore, which obviously helps the intense or creepy vibes. In terms of the visual elements, look at the lighting. It's very dark. If we look at it in value, it's low key overall. Low key basically just means dark or more usage of dark values overall, which obviously contributes to the dark, dramatic and creepy vibe. In terms of size proportions, the player is very small and the world is large or grand in comparison, especially when you see the giant statues, which can help make the player feel alone and abandoned. We have some crumbled, worn down, rusty, overgrowing textures, which are really high in detail, which helps immersion, but the asymmetrical, irregular pattern textures really help that abandoned, shady, creepy aspect of the game's atmosphere. And notice actually there's a lot of details left out. This is good for the clarity element, which we'll get onto later, but for atmosphere, I think it helps the mystery and curiosity, as your brain wants to fill in the rest of the details. The shapes are also very sharp. The character, environment, and enemies are full of triangles. Generally, triangles can be associated with danger because of their sharp looking nature, which is reminiscent of spikes, needles, swords, and knives and stuff. So from this, it might make us nervous or get the feeling of suffering. And finally, the colors, which are heavily desaturated, which makes it more grounded in realism and can be quite dull for that creepy dramatic vibe compared to the feeling you might get from something more cartoony like Stardew Valley. How does this make you feel? We got happy, calm, homely, engaging, relaxing, peace, nostalgic, chill, friendly, tranquil. And how does it achieve this? Well, the context is a farming sim pixel art game. We can see a character fishing, we got some farm animals, all in a natural setting. In terms of visual elements, the colors are really highly saturated with high contrast hues, some saturated reds and greens everywhere, which is really the opposite to Blasphemous, which makes it more cartoony and even friendly. In terms of value, we have more of a mid-range key, which, unlike the dark low-key values we got from Blasphemous, might give us more of a relaxed feeling. The screen is full with high detailed textures. Everywhere you look, you discover something new, so it feels fresh and engaging. In terms of pattern and symmetry, there's a nice balance in pattern here. We've got elements of uniform tiled pattern in the grass texture, the trees, but we have some unique elements like the paths and grass edges. It might be too chaotic or be super organic if everything is completely different, or on the reverse side, too boring or sterile if everything is the same. Let's compare this with a similar-ish game. Graveyard Keeper. How does it make you feel? We got medieval, grim, dull exploration, satisfaction, peaceful, tranquil, and undisturbed. The context is your 
graveyard keeper in a medieval setting which immediately is obviously less wholesome than Stardew Valley. In terms of visual elements, for the patterns both have high detailed textures but graveyard keeper is more towards the unbalanced, unsymmetrical and less structured pattern style which I think is closer to realism as if nature was left to just do its thing. While the lightness or value key is very similar, notice how graveyard keeper has a lower value range altogether where Stardew Valley has a high value contrast everywhere which I think is more unrealistic or cartoony. In terms of colours, they're definitely less saturated overall for Graveyard Keeper, moving away from the cartoony towards realism. The hues are tinted towards a dusky beigey brown and are more analogous, meaning the colours are in one limited hue area of the colour wheel, rather than the fully individual saturated colours that are found in Stardew Valley. Hollow Knight uses an analogous colour palette too, but it's got a very different vibe. So how does it make you feel? Well, the words we got were gloomy, forlorn, melancholic, depressing, sorrow, sickness, mysterious, sad, creepy and strange. We have unusual bug-like creatures with skeletal features in low lit areas, surrounded by gothic, kind of Victorian-esque delicate metalwork. In terms of visual components, we have the light which is low key, really dark backgrounds adding to that gloominess. We have analogous colour scheme, but this time it's tinted towards dark blue and grey. Sometimes the blues can be associated with that forlorn sadness as it seems cold and unwelcoming. There's a strong usage of fog in the scenery. You get this when the value contrast is very low as the objects are faded, not showing all of the details, which I think helps add to the mysterious atmosphere of the game. The shapes are very sharp, long, thin and wiry, which aren't very welcoming or soft. Proportionally, we have a small character in a big world here, which I think definitely adds to the sadness, the loneliness and the dangerous feeling of this game. And if you look at the characters, they're almost expressionless, apart from some of the eyes of some which are drooped to show the forlorn or sad nature of the world. Which, speaking of, has irregular patterns everywhere and is full of detail. This works well to create interesting and engaging environments that feel full of life and places to discover, despite the actual characters and colour scheme being very limited. Let's take a look at The Messenger, which has a completely different style. How does it make you feel? Well, we got nostalgic, retro, mysterious, secretive, mystic, fantasy and relaxed. In the context is this tiled pixel art game where you're some sort of ninja. Definitely helps that fantasy feeling. In terms of visual elements, I think it looks nostalgic and retro because the graphics share a lot of similarities with some older retro games. These levels have strong limited colour palettes with really exaggerated and almost unrealistic colours which definitely helps that mystical fantasy feeling. This green and blue mixed colour palette is high key as well and full of nature so it looks relaxed and mystic despite the dangers. They're tiled assets with repeating textures everywhere. Retro games did this because of the limits of the consoles, so that definitely helps the nostalgic or retro vibe. The shapes appear balanced with squares, triangles and circles appearing throughout. And the shapes are also used to help describe specific backgrounds. Check out all of the vertical lines in the trees level, which I think makes you feel like you're high up. And all the sharp shapes and triangles in this dangerous area. This place doesn't feel very welcoming at all. The interesting thing about this game is that the style of the game changes as you play it from an 8-bit art style to a 16-bit version, which I'll mention again later on. As the style changes, so does the sprite style change. If we look at the 8-bit version, we have limited detail in a small pixel size with four colours only. If that doesn't contribute to the retro or nostalgic feeling, I don't know what will. Hopefully you can see from these examples that the context of the game is helped by the cohesive art direction, where intentional visual decisions have been made in order to help strengthen the atmosphere of the game. And these are just select areas and levels of the game shown too. Different areas or levels might have different atmospheres completely. And you can create different atmospheres for storytelling purposes, to add interest, or for just simply making the player feel a certain way in a certain area. Think of Super Mario, for example. At the start, it's very light and not very threatening, but the game reaches its climax at Bowser's castle, which is dark and threatening to really heighten the intensity. And it's subjective too, what makes you feel relaxed might make someone else feel the opposite. While the answers I got from the polls definitely trended towards particular moods, there was some variety in the answers there as well. So if you're curious how your art makes people feel, then just get some feedback during the process. Our community discord has a feedback section for this very thing. The second element of game art is clarity, which is more focused on the functional side of game art. Does the player know what's going on? Do they know their objective? Do they feel immersed or are they just confused? You can control the answers to these questions with some visual design tools. And again, it's important to mention that art is not the only way to create clarity in games. Good game design is vital too. But visually, the three C's are key here. Contrast, consistency and expectations. Notice how I went against your expectations there? Starting with contrast. Contrast just means a difference. 
If similarities are uniform or pattern-like, intentional differences to that uniform style will obviously stand out. We can do this visually in a lot of ways. Color, size, value, detail, texture, and much more. Let's imagine a game with a player, enemies, pickups, and super pickups. You have to move around the map collecting these things while avoiding the enemies. If everything is the same shape and size and color, how can you possibly distinguish between the different things so that you can play the game and not be super confused? Let's make the enemies a different shape to the player so we can easily identify the player and the enemy. And what if the pickups were smaller than the character and the enemies because they're secondary and less important? But because the super pickups are more important than the normal pickups, we'll make them just slightly bigger. How do we know where to go? Well, we make the walls a different color so we know the routes we can take. Maybe the enemies have different patterns, so we'll have to color them differently so we know which one is which. And all of a sudden, you've got Pac-Man. A game that anyone can pick up and play, partially thanks to the effective use of contrast. Another important thing to consider with clarity are the player's expectations. If the floor is ice, for example, a player might expect to slip. If the floor is lava, the player might expect to burn. If there's a wall, the player might expect to not be able to move past it. If you want to meet players' expectations, you'll want to make sure your game art works with your game design and not against it. Saying that, from what I've seen, you can subvert a player's expectations to create some interesting moments. It's up to you how you manage the player's expectations, but if something doesn't align with what might be expected, just be wary that this could cause unintended consequences, confusion or frustration on the player's part. And the last but certainly not least important point to talk about with clarity is consistency. Basically, if you set rules or expectations with your art, do you keep the rules you've established or do you break them? Breaking them can cause player frustration, whether that's intentional or not. Notice in Jump King how every area you can jump on is strongly highlighted. Jump King is a hard game, but it's not unfair. If you jumped on a platform and fell through, the player's expectation would be broken and it would feel unfair. And the same goes for your overall art direction. If you establish design rules for your entire game, maybe it has a limited palette, character and the enemies are outlined to stand out. If you're not consistent with the art rules you're setting up and you're just constantly changing them, it can make the game feel less cohesive overall. Remember, you're not just designing a single scene. Everything in your game should fit together to create one immersive world. Unless, of course, your objective is the opposite. To help you think about clarity and how you achieve it in your game, it's quite simple. First, just list the aspects of your game design and rank them in a hierarchy of importance to the player. Maybe the player's position is the most important, so the player character should stand out the most. And the UI should stand out so we know the status of the player. And then maybe the enemy position, if we have to avoid it, for example. And the pickups. And then the background. Obviously, it's up to you to decide how much each ranked aspect stands out from one another and what methods of contrast you use to achieve that visually. But either way, you should consider the consistency of your choices. And to be consistent with your choices throughout the rest of your game art, all you have to do is write down the components of the style you have established and follow that as a rule set. Obviously, there are exceptions and there may be times where you want to divert from that rule set. The Messenger, for example, which moves from the 8-bit art style to the 16-bit art style as the character moves forward in time during the game. Pretty sweet, right? But this is an intentional change of art direction that fits with the game's design and story. It's not just a random moment of deviation. So remember, having a clear set of visual rules to follow is crucial for cohesive art direction throughout your whole game. Here's some more examples using the games you suggested in the community. Blasphemous. Remember we seen how the environment had details left out which helped the atmosphere? But it also helps the clarity in that the play area is clearly defined and there's nothing distracting you from the main area of action. It's obviously going to be important that the player stands out so you know where they are at all times. So notice how the player character has a high value range compared to the backgrounds and a highly saturated red in their palette which helps them stand out from the lowest saturated surrounding colours. In Hollow Knight, the characters are outlined. They're made up of simple shapes with low detail, which helps make them stand out against the highly detailed backgrounds. The player, the enemies and the UI have a higher value range than the backgrounds, so they stand out, which makes sense because the player should know where their character is at all times. Then we have Celeste, a precision platforming game which uses contrast expertly. The mid-ground area you can jump on is clearly defined. This area stands out from the background due to the contrast in value and the saturated colours. The background is still detailed, but it doesn't overburden the play area it has a lower colour and value range. Notice how the pickup is big and glowing with a saturated green colour unique to the rest of the palette. It must be quite an important element to the game design. And the dangers stand out from the flat areas so the players know exactly what to avoid. The platforms are flat, the spikes are sharp and the pits are bottomless. If you fall on the spikes or down the pit, you have to restart. So the visual elements of Celeste's art 
meet the player's expectations. I think the main point with clarity is that it's important to consider the player's experience when designing your game art. Using contrast and consistency effectively can make their experience more enjoyable, or frustrating if the opposite is your goal. <laughs> The final element of game art is theme. I think considering the theme of your game is important because it's part of the reason why the player might check out and play your game and why they might initially be interested in it. Like if I see a medieval fantasy theme game, I'm probably going to check it out because I like that. But I'm not too keen on space themed games, so that might be something I avoid. Everyone has their preferences when it comes to theme. And you don't always need to have a strong theme because that's also a theme. It's the minimal theme. This game is one of my favourite indie games that has a minimalistic theme. The art is great in terms of clarity. The animation, music, sound effects and polish do a lot of heavy lifting and bring a nice experience overall. And you don't have to go with any of the predefined obvious themes either because guess what? Weird is also a theme, it's just abstract. When you first look at P1 Select for example, you might be thinking what is going on here? But don't let it fool you. It's a fantastic game with really clever game design. It's up to you what theme you go for, if you even go for a theme, if it's intentional or not. But intentional theme choice can help make your game more appealing to certain audiences. There are some things to keep in mind, obviously. If you pick a really abstract theme, it may be really hard to gain interest if nobody can tell what's going on. But on the flip side, if it's so abstract and weird, that could be the main reason people check out your game, because it's so different from what's already out there on the market. Post Void had this effect on me, for example. I checked it out, I played it, and I love it. The reason I checked it out is because it looks more abstract than the games I'm used to. And on the other side of the scale, if you pick a really common theme, it may be easier to gain initial interest because people are already familiar with the subjects and they might be a fan of them. But if it's too generic, it might be harder to stand out because your game is competing with all the other games in that theme. So maybe a balance would work well. Regardless, when it comes to theme, I think it's always important to choose something that interests you because you're the one that has to work on it. And something that you're passionate about will always be better than something that you don't really care about. This GDC talk by George Fan does a great job of showing you how to choose your theme. So if you're stuck, I'd highly recommend checking that out. So hopefully now you have a good idea of what I call the Game Art Act and the three elements, atmosphere, clarity and theme. And you can think about these elements of game art as a pie chart or a Venn diagram. There's a lot of overlap between these elements and how much focus you put into each one is completely up to you. And maybe you think there are more elements that I haven't considered, which is completely fine. I'm obviously still learning too, so if you've got anything to add, make sure you share your insights in the comments below. And I don't want to overwhelm you either. You can get stuck in analysis paralysis if you're constantly thinking about how your game works. So I think it's best just to crack on with what you're comfortable with. But saying that, how do you put Put that all into practice. Obviously everyone works differently but I'm going to show you how I do it. The first thing you need is an idea. In my last art video we looked at concept art where we generate an idea and bring it to life. Check that out if you're struggling to come up with an idea yourself. My game is a hardcore precision platformer where you have to get to the top. Inspired by Jump King and getting over it. It follows the story of Lumber, my little dwarf character. And the starting area of the game is the woods where he lives or used to live before his house was set on fire. Next I like to establish the art direction. If you don't have a set style you work in already, you might want to do some analysis. So you can see here my reference board where I've gathered a bunch of games with styles that I really like. Basically just look at them, break them down and write some notes and figure out what I like and what I can use for my game. Jump King here with the heavy atmosphere backgrounds, super high detailed with a simple character. This game Jackaxe is kind of cool too, it's got really nice patterns and clear and simple shapes. Uh, this game called Nightmare in the Dark is really cool but it helped me learn that I do want to avoid making the backgrounds a bit too complex. I think it distracts from the platforms a bit too much, which for my game is not going to work. Nuclear Throne has this really nice cartoony style. The simple shapes and limited colours for characters and backgrounds really helps make the characters stand out and makes the stages really unique. After doing that and gathering some solid references and textures that you see here. I made some notes of what I like and what I wanted to use. So I came up with this art direction. The backgrounds will be split into a background, midground, and foreground. There'll be no outlines anywhere, but they'll be highly detailed for atmosphere and immersion. The far background will have the lowest value range because it's the least important. The midground and platforming area will have the highest value range because obviously the platforms are an important element. And I'll have a foreground layer to add depth for the atmosphere. It'll just be one simple value not very detailed, so it doesn't distract from the main play area. And the character Lumber is the most important, so it's going to be outlined as well as being very simple in detail to stand out from that high detail background. 
To start creating the mock-up, I start with a value rough, simply following my art direction plan, thinking of the shapes and value contrast. I took a screenshot of the prototype level of my game and took that in Eclipse Studio Paint so that I could draw my level design on top of it. After I'm happy with the rough values, I then moved on to the colour rough. This is the starting area of the game and where Lumber lives, so I really want the mood to be warm and homely. So for this, I'm using complementary colours red and green and testing out different variations to see what kind of feeling I get from them. And once I got something I'm happy with, I then move on to the shapes. And as I love the organic shapes of Jump King, I decided to go more in that direction as it's slightly more realistic and immersive for the atmosphere. And I'll also have the character stand out as well. The character uses simple shapes, but the background will be more complex organic shapes. Once I figured all of that out, it was just time to tweak it and polish it until I finished. So for the theme, it's obviously a fantasy woodland with giant trees and dwarfs and a fairy in there. For the atmosphere, I've used warm, complementary colours to make it look homely and inviting. And for the clarity, we have an outlined, simple character to stand out against the high detailed, complex, organic shapes. I've clearly defined the platform so the player knows exactly where they can jump onto, and the fairy collectible has a high value and colour contrast against the background. So what do you think? How does this game mock-up make you feel? Do you think I've hit all the elements? And do you think it hits the atmosphere that I'm going for? And if you like the look of it, you can wishlist the game now on Steam. I don't have a release date or anything and everything on there is placeholder, but we'll get to that eventually in a future video. But until then, I've got a challenge for you. Create a game art mock-up. If you're not working on a game already, I want you to create a singular level or screen for a platforming game. That's to have one character, one enemy and one item or pickup. And try and think about the game art act while you're doing this. What I'm Atmosphere are you trying to get across? How will you define clarity with your contrast and your consistency? And will there be a set theme or perhaps a minimal or abstract look? It's completely up to you. And feel free to work in any style you want. 2D, pixel, 3D, just whatever floats your boat. If you share your finished entries on the Discord, I'll share some in an upcoming video, just like I did with this challenge. In this concept art video, I challenge you to come up with an idea and bring it to life with some concept art. Let's take a look. Best took this little scissor rod idea and turned it into a full model. And I designed and modeled their own character too. Super cool. Linpus turned this sad looking tree stump into a mini world inspired by European castles. And Vavane made a nature spirit inspired by Ukrainian mythology. BBS created this mushroom inspired game idea and Lossy created some micro metroidvanias. For characters, Mufluffy created an unusual and charming shadow like character. Check out this ghost by Just Typical Me. So nice. Nice. Green created this incredible mermaid character with sketches, references and a custom palette. And how about a dinosaur with a hat? We got some full scenes too. Vel created this beautifully lit statue in a lake. And Beatrix Paul created a full concept scene with excellent idea generation, referencing and exploration throughout the whole process. And last but certainly not least, Aliokis created this incredible cave ruins artwork. I was super impressed with this and the thumbnail designs. Each composition looks like it could be turned into a final peace. If you liked this video or found it helpful, make sure you leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to follow me on my art and game dev journey. Thanks for watching everyone, I'll see you in the next video.